Welcome to Amazing Brains. Um, I'm so pleased you could join us, whether in person or from your sofa at home. Uh, I'm Mark Charnock. Uh, though you probably don't know who I am, you might know me better by another name as I've played a coach called Marlon Dingle in the soap Emmerdale for over 25 years. And I'm not out of my comfort zone at all. <laughs> Everybody looks really smart, so can all of you just look down and not? It's really quite intimidating. Anyway, earlier this year, and the reason I'm here, I guess, is that um, my character Marlon had a stroke. The Stroke Association and Stroke Survivors played a huge role in shaping the storyline with the Emmerdale team. We felt a real uh, responsibility to get the story right for stroke survivors and, of course, their loved ones, as well as for those who've lost someone to a stroke. Through the Stroke Association, we spoke to stroke survivors, stroke professionals, clinicians and teams across the charity to get the story of Marlon's stroke and his recovery as, as realistic as possible. Of course, Marlon's stroke story isn't like anybody else's because the experience of stroke is as unique as we are. The uniqueness of a stroke is partly because we are all different in the first place, whether we've had a stroke or not. But there are also facets of the stroke itself which can shape what happens next. First, as you guys know, a stroke could strike in many different places in the brain. This affects the initial signs that a stroke is happening, whether you have the well-known fast symptoms or something less well-known like vertigo. Second, there are differences in whether and how you quickly can access emergency treatment and what kind of treatment you get. The quicker and more effective the treatment, the better the chances are of survival and recovery. Third, as you rebuild your life after a stroke, your goals will be unique to you and therefore so is the support you need to achieve them. Rehabilitation is what we'll be looking at during Amazing Brains this year. Specifically, rehabilitation of thinking and memory skills. With the generosity of their wonderful supporters, like some of you here tonight, and some of you watching from home, of course, the Stroke Association has invested over £55 million in stroke research since 1992. The charity's vision is to support people to rebuild their lives after stroke. So while they fund research on prevention and emergency treatment, the majority of the research they support has been on recovery and rehabilitation. Stroke research is vital in helping people recover from all the effects of their stroke. Some of these effects are easily noticeable. You know, if you have muscle weakness in one of your legs or if you have difficulty in forming words, you and others can usually easily recognise that you might want support. A crutch, for example, or speech and language therapy. However, there are many other effects that are not so clear, sometimes even to a stroke survivor themselves. So when you struggle to remember someone's name or you can't concentrate, it's, it's much harder to tell whether that's because you've had a stroke or if there's another reason. You might not know that there is also support available for those difficulties. And tonight, we'll hear from three brilliant speakers about the importance of research into the effects of stroke on thinking and memory. After the talk, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, so uh, please save them for the end. So, our first talk is from Dr. Terry Quinn, a stroke researcher and a medical doctor whose team's been supported by the Stroke Association. He's a reader in cardiovascular and medical sciences at the University of Glasgow and honorary consultant physician in stroke at the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Terry's research is about how to measure complex ideas such as thinking and memory abilities so that we can assess them accurately in research and in clinical practice. This evening he'll be talking about the burden um, that current ways of measuring thinking and memory can place on stroke survivors and the importance of understanding each stroke survivor as an individual so that they can be offered the right support for their recovery rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. So um, please welcome Terry to the stage. Thank you. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, all you beautiful people here in the creek. And thank you to the 2,500 people who've registered to watch this online. 
Hello, Matthew and Daisy, who are now watching. <laughs> so I am Terry, and I'm going to share with you a story of my research looking at the psychological effects of stroke. So tonight we're going to talk about depression and confusion. The depression and confusion that I've researched, but also the depression and confusion that I've experienced trying to navigate research in this very difficult topic. But I'm going to end with a story of hope because I think, along with many other things that research gives us, stroke research gives us hope. And, you know, we need some hope right now. We really do. So it would be traditional for a stroke researcher on a stage like this to throw up a slide with some brain scans, some graphs, some data. So I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm going to show you pictures of people. Because I think we can sometimes get blinded by the science and we can forget stroke affects people. Stroke affects you know, people like me. Maybe people like you. Definitely people like Paul, who's in the photograph here. So Paul Gribben is a member of our stroke research group in Glasgow. And I've got to know Paul really well. And he said something to me many years ago that, that really struck. He said as he recovered, people would come up to him in the street and they'd say, Paul, you're doing brilliantly. You're speaking better, you're walking better, your arm's moving better. And Paul would say, yeah, all that's true, but they can't see what's going on up here. They can't see how I'm really struggling to concentrate. They can't see how incredibly tired I am all day. They can't see the fact that my confidence is absolutely shattered. And it wasn't just Paul that was telling me this. All of the stroke survivors that I was seeing in the clinic and research were telling me the same thing about these hidden effects of stroke. And so what happens if you go to your stroke team not so long ago, if you said to your stroke doctor, you know, I'm, I'm struggling here with confusion, your stroke team would say, oh, right, well, that sounds like mental health. That should probably go to psychiatry. And the psychiatrist would say, oh, you know, that could be dementia. That should probably go to a memory clinic. And you'd go to the memory clinic and they'd say, oh, you're a bit young for us. You better go back to stroke. And people would go round and round services, not getting support, confusion, depression, and no hope. There was a real silo way of thinking. Things are changing, but they're not changing fast enough. And this isn't niche. Our group have shown that at any point in time, one in five stroke survivors have memory and thinking problems that are so severe we would call them dementia. Or if you want to look at the numbers another way, Look to your left, look to your right. One in three people will have a stroke or develop dementia or have both. This isn't niche. This is absolutely core stroke medicine. And so I'd like to say that it was because of my incredible intellect and vision that I realised that researching this was important, that, that that wouldn't be true. People told me, stroke survivors told me, so here we've got photographs of some of the, the research groups that we've ran in Glasgow where stroke survivors have told us the things that are important to them. And that shaped all of the research that I'm going to share with you tonight and all of the research that we continue to perform in Glasgow. And I was incredibly fortunate because through the support of the Stroke Association, I was able to embark on a programme of work. When you start these things, you have to have a nice abbreviation. So my abbreviation was APPLE, Assessing Post-Stroke Psychology a longitudinal evaluation. Luckily, Steve Jobs and the Beatles didn't sue me <laughs> for using Apple, and we were able to get started on a programme of work. And when I started this, what I realised was actually how little I knew. So I had a, a view of the world that was probably shared by a lot of stroke clinicians, that people would be living their life, and then they'd have a stroke. Some people would develop problems with memory and thinking, some people wouldn't and you could very easily tell them apart, and then they'd continue along, and then maybe in the future we might have a treatment that could help people. It was a nice world view. It was simple. It really lent itself to research, but it was completely wrong. And so what we've done in the Apple program is we've deconstructed this, and we've created a new way of how we think about memory and thinking problems in clinical practice that is more difficult, but it's real and it reflects the messy reality of how these things really are. And so the first thing I want to talk about is this idea that everyone starts at the same baseline. 
we've got a quote from a stroke survivor here that, that really summarises this for you. Well, of course, people don't start at the same baseline. We know that after a certain age, for all of us, memory and thinking will start to decline a little bit. But for some people, that could be much more substantial. I promise you pictures of people. Here's a person. This is Martin. He's one of the many PhD students that was supported by the Apple programme. And, I, and Martin's PhD was all about the person before the stroke. How do we assess their memory? How do, they set, how do we assess their thinking? And what do we find? Well, we found that in the UK, probably 10 to 15% of people presenting with a stroke actually have dementia. But for many of them, that's never been diagnosed because they've not sought help before. The stroke is the thing that brings them to medical attention. But what we also found through Martin's work was you can find out about memory and thinking problems before the stroke using really quite simple questionnaires. And those are questionnaires that we're now trying to embed in practice. So let's move along to this idea that I had that it'd be really easy with a pencil and paper test to distinguish people who did and who didn't have memory and thinking problems. And again, you've got a quote here from, from one of our stroke survivors telling you about their experience of cognitive testing. So when I started, I knew about some tests. Maybe your favourite's on the screen, maybe it's not. And then I looked at the stroke literature and stroke textbooks and I found some other tests. But then I looked at the psychiatry and the psychology literature and I found some other tests. Then I looked at the OT literature and I found some more tests. And it just seemed to be drowning in tests that were said to be the best test for looking at memory and thinking in stroke. And we had a look at this. So we looked at almost 500 papers in scientific journals that looked to measure memory and thinking in stroke survivors. 500 papers. How many different tests do you think were used? 367. So there were almost as many tests as there were research groups. Everyone was doing their own thing. There was no consistency at all. So that's, that's research. Researchers are all a bit crazy, let's be honest. Sorry, Audrey. Um, how about in practice? So we did a questionnaire. We asked every stroke unit in Scotland, you know, what are, what are the memory and thinking tests that you use routinely? Remember, Scotland's not that big. How many do you think there were? There were 47. So again, everyone doing their own thing, no consistency, no standardisation, and that's something that we wanted to change. So here's Roz. She also did a PhD with me. And she started to look at, well, you know, is there a best test? Is there an optimum test? And the unfortunate answer is there isn't, because the test you use has to vary with what you want it to do. And it has to vary with where in that person's stroke journey you're testing them. What we did find from Rose's work, though, was that most, if not all, of the tests we were using at that point had been derived from a specialist memory clinic type setting. So in the memory clinic, you tend to have a lot of time. You often have a lot of expertise. You perhaps have experts in neuropsychology there to help you administer the test. So we were taking these tests and we were using them here in the A&E of Glasgow Royal, where I've got 10 minutes at a push to make decisions on what I'm going to do. So clearly, there's a mismatch in where these tests were designed and where we were using them. Let me just illustrate that a bit more. So here we've got a test. This is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, made famous by ex-President Donald Trump, who told the world that he scored 30 out of 30, so you can decide for yourself whether you think it's accurate. But <laughs> let's say we take this test down to A&E and try and apply it to someone that, that's, that's just experienced a stroke. And you say to the person with a stroke, could you join up the dots for me? But because of that person's stroke, they're not seeing so well. And they say, well, what dots? I don't see any dots. Or you give them a pen and you say, draw a cube for me, draw a clock, and they can't. Not because of any memory and thinking problems, but because of the stroke. So you can see there's a problem here. There's a problem in trying to use these tests that were developed for other purposes in a stroke space. And that was the theme of, of Emma's PhD. So Emma started to develop much shorter tests that did retain the accuracy and that could, that could be used in a stroke setting. Now, how about this? my idea that people just tracked along. It's the thing that's probably most important to people. It's what they ask, am I going to get better? Well, we had a look at that too. So in the Apple study, we checked memory at time points 
right up to 18 months after the stroke. And what we found was people tend to have different trajectories of recovery. But I think the important message is almost all people do recover to a greater or lesser extent. So we then thought, well, can we, can we predict these people? If we can predict the people who perhaps aren't going to do so well, we can target resources at them. And we did find that things like age and certain medical conditions were associated with your trajectory, but it wasn't, it wasn't an easy association. These things all interacted with each other in complex ways, and they interacted with the stroke, and they interacted with who you were before the stroke. So we had to create quite sophisticated statistical models to allow us to choose someone's trajectory, but we were able to do it. And that's where our stroke survivors challenged us again, because they said, well, you're looking at predicting the people that are going to do badly, and you're thinking about things like diabetes and heart disease. Here's what we want to know. We want to know what are the things that protect the brain. Tell us about the people that are going to do well, because those are the things that we want to do. And we're starting to look at that now, and we're finding that things like physical fitness, having a network of people, a good education all seem to protect you. And that's the work from another alumni of the Apple study, Bogner, another of my PhD students. And of Bogner's many papers, I just want to draw your attention to the middle one, which is the European guideline on how we manage people that have memory and thinking problems. So this work, supported by the Stroke Association, is changing practice right now, not just here in London or here in the UK, but right across Europe. The last thing where, again, I have to admit I was wrong, was my thought that this is just about the stroke survivor. Sometimes it is, but for many people, there's a family around them, and that family are also touched by the stroke, they're touched by the memory and thinking problems. And so one of my current PhD students is Maria, and she's interviewing caregivers of people with stroke and dementia to find out about that experience. In the photograph here, you've got all of the doctor's letters from one person, all their appointments to look after their stroke and memory problems. And, you know, the, the quote is there, why does it have to be so bloody hard? Actually, because it's East End of Glasgow, they didn't say bloody. They said something <laughs> a little bit more colourful, but you get the idea. So we've went from this paradigm that was, you know, easy and wrong to something that looks a bit more like this, where we're considering the person before the stroke, we're thinking about how we can maybe predict things, we're looking at different trajectories, and we're considering the family and the caregivers around the person. I've got one more researcher I want to talk about. He's very close to me. Um, so before I had this funding, I was in a situation where my contract was about to run out. I was applying for lots of fellowships, and I was getting rejection after rejection after rejection. And you can see some quotes there. So clearly, there was something that they didn't like about me. It didn't quite fit what they were looking for. But I had all this ambition and I had these ideas and I just I needed a funder to take a bit of a punt. And that's exactly what the Stroke Association did, not just with me, but actually for the people in this photograph, for, lo for lots of people in this room. They've supported these people and many others. And the people in this photograph have went on to become professors, chairs of their department, international leaders. So they've made a huge difference. And that's through your support and it's through the support of the Stroke Association. So I'm going to end where I began with Paul. And one time when I was interviewing Paul, I said to him, now, Paul, you've helped with lots of my studies now. Is there anything that you regret at all? He said, you know, Terry, there is, there is one thing that I regret. I regret when the studies come to an end. And that's what we now face. You know, if you don't continue doing what you're doing, if you don't continue supporting the Stroke Association, the research will come to an end. And my time is coming to an end. I see the sign is being held up to tell me to hurry up. <laughs> So I'm going to stop speaking there. Thank you for listening. <laughs>